good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And I am Kent Rogers, and I'm at Freiburg, first lecturer on August 17th. So today I'm going to talk about church as bride and how it informs meaningful community to go along with the theme of the week, which is building meaningful community. Uh, so I'm going to actually start with the problems that churches are facing in general, uh, and then tie it in later to what the solutions might be. Uh, discontent parishioners, I have encountered these, I assume most of us who are in the church have run across them. Disengaged parishioners, uh, maybe they come to church, uh, but that's it, and uh, it's hard to get momentum going when people are not fully engaged. No parishioners, or dwindling <laughs> parishioners. I know that unfortunately many congregations in our uh, beloved Swedenborgian churches have had to close. Uh, no youth pastors because there's no youth, that's a particular problem we are facing in my church, and uh, it's a top priority for us is how do we get some young people. Uh, in fighting among clergy and leadership, I think that's pretty common too, and sad. Uh, lack of funding, uh, lack of con contributions, which is a, a kind of disengagement. Uh, diminished influence on society around us. Churches are increasingly feeling irrelevant, um, both socially and also our spiritual message. Uh, diminished interest in church and religion around us, which is the other side of the same coin. Uh, our current culture is really a post-Christian culture, and we consider ourselves, in a way, a post-Christian church, but we haven't caught up. Um, you can see some influences and in things such as psychology, um, but as a real spiritual practice or discipline, we really um, are largely unknown and therefore irrelevant still. Uh, and all of this causes clergy to gain you know, it, it's easy to become apathetic. Well, what we do is, you know, irrelevant and the parishioners aren't really interested. So it's easy for us to get uh, frustrated. Uh, and, that, and then we can all start to feel some pretty profound loneliness uh, because it's a spiritual type of loneliness. It's, we're out there we're meaningless, people don't really care what we have to say, even though it's what we care so much about, and that can lead to a pretty sad state. And also feeling a kind of powerlessness. I have something inside of me that I love and is burning, and I just don't know how to communicate this in a way that is meaningful to anyone else. And so all of these things are facing our church, and I think churches in general. Um, and so there is evidence that church is dying um, across the world, uh, at least Western world. Um, in some places it is growing. In Nepal, Christianity is growing. Uh, and we have to remember that a dying church, we were, it is predicted, would be the old church. So if the Swedenborgian churches are also dying, then we can say what's dying is actually part of the old church, uh, which to me gives me pause. Um, you know, so maybe what we are thinking of as the new church or the Swedenborgian church, depending on you know, the branch that you belong to, is actually part of the old church. Um, and that it, it is dying may not be a bad thing, but we do have to come up with a new idea of what we are 
to be if we're going to embody the new church. So let's take a look at what the Third Testament or writings of Swedenborg say about uh, what the new church really will be. And this painting, by the way, is by Kandinsky. Who? Kandinsky. All right, so what I did uh, to prepare for this is I said, well, I'm going to pick the New Jerusalem and its heavenly doctrine and in New Search, and I'm just going to write, Church is, and see what comes up. So um, this is what comes up. I was wondering if anyone would like to read the first one. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but that was, so there's a good deal of information. And all the blue highlighted information has something to do with marriage or a direct statement that the church is to be a bride and wife. So that's quite a bit. It's about half. And the, there is also a great emphasis that charity and love are the true kernel of what a church is. That charity and love is where the church is. And then what remains is and the word is read, and the Lord is worshipped as God. So those are the main elements. Where charity and love exist, where the Lord is worshipped as God, and the word is read, and that this is, uh, you know, this is what the bride is, or the wife is. And that is the image and model we are given. Uh, the very first number that has the words church is in it, um, in New Jerusalem and its heavenly doctrine, is this. The church is called in the word the bride and the wife of the Lord. She is called the bride before conjunction and the wife after. The very first number. And then I thought, well, let's see what, the, what was in the last <coughs> published work, True Christian Religion, if I type in the words good is and look at the very last number of that work that has those two words together, what will I find? And this is what I find. What this church, new church, is going to be like is amply described in the book of Revelation. That book is about the end of the former church and the rise of the new church. The new Jerusalem, all the magnificent things about it, and its future as the bride and wife of the Lamb our portrayal of the new church. And then it says, I'll just quote a little bit of Revelation, almost to stimulate the reader to say, okay, here we have the clue, let's take a look at the details and figure out what it means. It's an invitation to, to look at this and find out what the symbolic meaning of the description of the bride or the new Jerusalem has to say about how we should be organized and what we should be doing. Uh, but what really strikes me about all this information is first that the church is unequivocally holy and wholly feminine. It doesn't say bride and groom, it just says bride and wife. Uh, and it's a little ironic that at least in some branches it's a group of men governing the church and saying what it should be and what it is and who can join it. And it doesn't happen to include any women. Uh, and also the magnitude of this role. We are to be of and embodying what is described as the wife of the Lord. That is immense. And if we hear it correctly, it's humbling. And uh, humbling to the point that that which we perceive of as ourselves, um, we can understand that to be the guest to this marriage. And there are many places where it says, well, this marriage is actually between love and wisdom inside of us, and both of those are the Lord. And our consciousness is given to be as a guest or a bridesmaid. And there are lots of parables about the bridesmaids and the wedding feasts, and we can learn from those too. However, when we sit as a guest, humbly at this marriage, then we are, um, 
we can serve as the functioning of the bride in the world. So we can express it here on earth. And there's a beautiful passage in TCR that's coming to mind just now that says, because the Lord can't do good to others directly, he breathes his love into us as the love of a parent for children that we might do good to one another. Uh, so what is the change that needs to occur from us to be the old dying church to a new, vibrant, growing, meaningful, relevant church in the world? And we kind of have to look at what's wrong to figure that out. So in this image, this is the first powerful image in Revelation chapter 12 of the church as the bride um, or wife of the Lord. And there are three uh, uh, images or characters in this uh, picture. The woman, and that she is described in the description, you know, the inner meaning of this chapter as those governed by love to the Lord. So that's the essence of the bride, we can say, is love to the Lord. And then there's Michael, who uh, is truth of the new church, and these are listed as the opposite of what the dragon has, which is the divorce of faith from charity, belief in three gods, and lack of belief that the Lord is actually God. You know, lip service, yes, but we don't really believe now, all of these things, uh, you know, as a youngster, I said, well, I don't believe in three gods, I don't divorce faith from charity, and, I, you know, our church does believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is God. So, but, obviously, something's still not right. So I sat and I thought, how does my experience of the new church uh, in include some of the dragon? Because I think that this must be something that currently is still a part of our church. So, first, faith divorced from charity. Uh, you know, we're, if you look at our churches, now, this is, I'm just beginning to have interaction with the convention, so I'm not talking so much about the convention, I, I can't speak for you, but I've been a part of the general church, and the Lord's new church, and, um, I can see these things, and I can see them in me too, uh, and that's really where the rubber hits the road is in the individual. So let me speak for myself. I often get stuck in the idea that the truths, the facts in the Word, including the Third Testament, and these ideas are really what matters that I have to get the ideas straight, and I have to communicate these ideas, and that's what the church is all about. And what, what does it look like? It looks like arguing with other people, uh, it looks like schisms in the church, uh, and it looks like, again, focusing <coughs> on the beliefs and ideas over application uh, to, and to loving others and to doing what's good um, in the name of the Lord. And another way it appears is that um, I focus on regenerating. i got to make myself better. I have to shun this evil. I have to throw out this bad habit. These are important. But what I've seen in culture that I've been raised in and in myself is focusing so much on the inner work that actual charity or doing good to other people becomes secondary. Now we learn in the writings or Third Testament that it's the second part of charity. So when we hear the word second, I think it makes us think it's secondary. But it's not at all. The first part of charity is only, which is the shunning of the evils, the repentance, that exists for the sake of loving other people. It is the footstool, the necessary lowest step to get to the point where we are doing good for this earth, for the Lord's children, for our brothers and sisters, 
from a state of love, clear of selfishness. And then this other thing that uh, you know I fall into is feeling special because I know all this cool stuff, or I belong to this cool church. Um, I remember when I started teaching at an evangelical school in Nepal, it was non-denominational, but it was largely uh, evangelical. Uh, I remember thinking, uh, these people are going to judge me because I'm a Swedenborgian, and they're going to be narrow-minded, and all these judgmental thoughts. And when, you know, about a month in, I was like, wow, these people are so good. <laughs> they are so loving. They are so in love with the Lord. And they haven't judged me. I'm the one who's been judging them. I'm the one who's been closed-minded. So that was a real eye-opener. Uh, and then three gods. The three gods in my life arises from a belief in the self as something other than as if. Uh, when I think myself is real, I judge myself. <coughs> and that's sort of like the father, separated from this other part of self that thinks, oh, I, if I do enough work, I'll save myself. I can do this, I'm going to work really hard. And that's sort of like son, and that's a separate thing. And then, oh, if I do a lot of good things for others, then uh, that's sort of equivalent to the Holy Spirit. But really, it's all stemming from a belief in self as God. So that's not going to work out. And it's a denial of the Lord as God. It's a denial of the Lord as God. So there we have the dragon. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to be that. Uh, what a horrid image. There's no more horrid image in a Bible full of horrid images. Um, so another thought I have um, is when we say that the dragonists make God three entities and the Lord two, we mean people who think of three persons as three gods and distinguish the Lord's humanity from his divinity. So the thought I have on this is that uh, there's the Lord up there in heaven. He lived on earth, now he's up in heaven. And then there's us doing things, trying to be good people, trying to know the right ideas and tell people about them, and do, do some good things incidentally. Uh, this is denying the humanity of the Lord. The humanity of the Lord, as I see it, is the humanity in one another. That's where the Lord is alive with us. That is the humanity of the Lord, at least as visible to us. And when we fail to see the Lord in one another, we're failing to worship the Lord in his humanity. And when we act and do without remembering that any good in that, in the thoughts or in what we do is the Lord, then again we are failing to worship the Lord, and we're worshiping the self. So I, you know, if anyone who knows me, you know, it's my soapbox that I pound on is the the absence of real self, and I really feel like that is an underlying, foundational truth within our belief system. Without truly comprehending, we fail to comprehend any of the other ideas well. Um, we as a self don't exist. We are given this illusion of selfhood that we might enjoy and participate in the marriage of the bride and lord uh, and feel that joy and share in it and love one another. But as soon as we start believing that the self has anything to do with this, we are booted out of that experience, and we can't see clearly after that. Um, and we divide Lord's humanity into two, like the previous quote said, the dragonists do, when we think faith is not a function and servant of loving others as a way to love the Lord, and loving the Lord to love others. And the reason it's dividing the Lord into two is because we have faith over here, 
we have good works over here, but really faith is a function of good works. It's a servant of good works. And I'll get to the differentiation between good and good works in a minute. Uh, so how do old church structures and methods contribute to this invasion of the dragon into our midst? Uh, again, we say, well, I belong to this church because I believe this. So I believe that the Third Testament has a, a deeper meaning, which we're allowed to explore. Well, I believe that we have to take it literally. Well, I believe that we can, you know, well, that's not really what the church should be defined by. Well, I'm, you know, you're a evangelical, I'm a fundamental, whatever. That's not what a church is supposed to be if we believe this idea that the essence of a church is love. Uh, and then hearing Sunday sermons as defining characteristic as of a member of the church. Again, it's all this is oriented towards ideas, and that's not the essence of a church. Church's main, or in some cases, only goal is to promulgate ideas. I'm not saying ideas and truth are not important. They are. We need them, but they we can't get distracted and think that they are the main thing. Cold buildings, silence, um, other such tone setters, which mute things such as celebrating, which is a function of love, uh, interacting with love, uh, joy in the Lord, lateral communications. One of the things I love about my new congregation is that there's a time where we get to, at the end of, still in the, it's before the word is closed, so part of church, but the floor is open. Well, what are your thoughts? And everyone gets to talk. It's a beautiful thing. Um, and the ambience, uh, ambience of promoting love is praying. And, well, oh, well, those things are for after the service. The problem is, if we think of the service as the essence of church, and the essence of church is cold and quiet and truth-oriented, well, then that's, we walk away thinking, well, that's the real church, and the chit-chat after the church is, you know, incidental. When really, the heart of church is loving each other because the Lord loves us. And then a hierarchy of power and centralized uh, government, which I'm not saying is bad, but when that becomes uh, a ruling instead of a serving, well, that's bad. It must be a humble servant to the good. And when it becomes a, well, uh, I'm going to be in power so I can get my way, or, you know, polit politics gets involved, and politics is not what church is supposed to be about. Uh, and then there's external props, um, rising to central importance, you know, ritual, you have to wear the robe, or you have to have the Holy Supper done in this way. Uh, these things can, again, distract us from the real essence, which is, you know, we're here to love in God's name, and all of these things are to promote love, and, you know, they're not essential. And then other ways that the dragon is attacking the new church, the bride. And again, when I say new church, I don't mean our denominations. I don't mean readers. I mean the true new church, um, which is, as someone uh, previous said in a lecture, is spread across the world. Um, but it, it's in our translations. So, for example, grand man. It makes us think of a man. And it's probably, actually, well, it's grand human, but if the church is feminine, a bride, a wife, then it's probably actually more accurate to say the grand woman. Um, he is our default pronoun. Now, there's, you know, it's hard to get around some of these things, but I'm just saying these things orient us towards symbols which we read over and over have to do with truth. Um, charity, rather than what is actually the better meaning of this word caritas or charitas, it's love. If you look it up, first thing it says is love. Um, goodwill, esteem. So charity doesn't have the same emotional impact, at least to me, that love does. Mm. Um, and I think they avoid the word love because amor, which is used more in relation to God, also means love. 
but it doesn't mean that caritas doesn't also mean love. So we, um, so I kind of like the word goodwill. Goodwill is warm and obviously between humans, and then we can save love for love to the Lord. And then um, there's this substantive uh, adjective bonum, which is often found in the Third Testament. And what that means is it's really an adjective, but in Latin you can use it as a noun, and you don't need to stick any noun after it of which it describes, so it's just bonum. And it's often translated as good. Uh, but good is a very abstract thing. What is good? Um, in English, we always attach some noun to it. So it's some, I, sometimes I think I've looked a little bit at the Latin. I'm not a Latin scholar whatsoever, whatsoever. So if someone can correct me, I'll be happy to be wrong. Um, I've looked, but I looked around, and it seems like in some places it is best described as good. It's talking about something abstract. But there are also other places which it clearly means good works or good affections, but it's still in some of the translations just good. And that and that what that does is it just it fails to stimulate our mind and heart to focus on, oh, it's not talking about something up here. It's talking about me taking an action of good. That's what this is saying. I have to live out good. It's good works. Or it's good love. We're talking about something I can experience, not with the head abstractly, but with my heart. So this whole page is about why um, this word bonum should at least sometimes be translated as good works. Um, so you can see the phrase there in Latin. I'm not going to try to read it. But the translation is, a brother, a shepherd of the flock, denotes one who exercises the good of charity. Do we exercise the good of charity? Or if we're exercising, it's going to be works, right? We exercise the good works of charity. That's what we can exercise. Uh, and then again, I'm not going to read that long Latin thing, but um, that a shepherd of the flock is one who exercises the good of charity must be obvious to everyone. And then later down at the bottom it says, he who does not lead, is talking about pastors, who do not lead to the good of charity and teach it is not a true shepherd. What is the good of charity if not good works? We have to be leading people to do good things. Um, and then AR, oh, by the way, that AC, that's the first number in uh, all of the writings of Swedenborg that have been published and are called the theological works, that has this phrase. Uh, and that first use of the word is talking about good works. And then Apocalypse Revealed says, in the entire world is there any nation having in it some religion that excludes anything saving from goods of charity? So here we have clearly defined that good of charity means which are good works. So at least sometimes, in some context, that word bonum should be translated good works. And John is the one who is given to see the holy city, New Jerusalem, descending as the bride. John represents good works, good works of charity. Uh, so there's three methods I think we can explore this new paradigm. And I guess I'm inviting us to think radically about what, how a church might look different. We have just taken on what the old Christian church's rituals and values were and just sort of glommed it into our way. But who knows what church could be? The sky's the limit. And if we imagine the, the function, the organization, and the purpose of the church according to the model of a bride or a wife of the Lord, let's start there with a blank slate and build up from that. What is our church going to look like? It could be very radically different. So there's one way is to think about the special powers and abilities of a woman as a bride and wife and look at what, and also 
So we can do it from our mind, our own ideas. We can also look at conjugal love. One thing I love about the denomination I belong to is we believe that we can read a book like Conjugal Love and understand it, not literally, but to be talking about something higher. So in this case, instead of a husband and wife on the natural sense between a, a literal man and woman, we can understand these all these statements about what a wife is to be and a, a woman to be and think of it as what is the church supposed to be in relation to the Lord. And I'm not saying that Swedenborg had those things in mind when he wrote it, just as some of the prophets didn't know that they were writing in internal sense, but the Lord can use the words that are bounded by 18th century male mind um, to express the higher truth when we are ready to see it. Um, and then another way, which we are invited to do, I think, by that TCR quote I read, is to look at all the things described of the holy city, New Jerusalem, and uh, both as city and as bride, and interpret what does this mean for us? What are we? What is the pearly gate? What are the streets of gold, clear as crystal? And try to figure out this out and say, well, okay, our church has to have this. So uh, just to stimulate thought, pearly gate. You know, Pearl is made by the poor oyster year after year, coating over this irritating grain of sand. And, you know, that's the program, the selfish, is that irritating grain of sand is always trying to get us to be selfish. And we coat it over with truth, and we coat it over with truth, and we do good. And we coat it over with the life of trying to lead a life of the Lord's love. And eventually, those efforts allow us to enter into a state of love to the Lord and love of others. And streets are where we move from one place to another. They're gold, gold is love, and they're clear as crystal. They're full of you know, clear communication. So there's talking in my mind about communicating with each other with love and openness. And a third way is to consider the church as we've done, you know, many of the lectures this week have been looking at uh, the organization of the body and looking at how that is a description of our societies, um, mostly in heaven, but we can do it as for our church too, and specifically we would um, probably be thinking, I mean, I think we should uh, think of uh, including the unique organs that uh, the, the woman's form has. So, I have three papers here, and I have three pens. I'd like to, you to divide into three groups, and I'm not going to say you have to do one of those three, but um, I would like you to just brainstorm of what does a church look like based on these three methods of what a church could be. And I invite men to not say anything. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to do the thing where we go like one, two, three, one, two, three, and so we're all mixed up? Uh, sure. One. Starting. One, two, three. One, two, two, three. Three. One, one two, three. You want to participate? If you don't want to participate, that's fine. One. I'm not saying anything. <laughs> right. One, wait, two, wait, wait. three. Wait, you know, I don't know where you are. All right, let's say <laughs> one, two, three. One, two, three. One, one, two, three. Three. Oh. Okay, I'm three. Who's three? I'm three. Okay, three. Good. One, two, two three. three. One. One, two, I'll be three. Jillian, you want to participate? No. And Trevor? Three. Now, uh, I realize that a lot of the things I said today may be upsetting, controversial. That's all right. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. Year two. So let's have ones come up here in this corner. Twos, you can go back near the door. And threes, you can go around the table there. All right.